I'm Martha Gilmer, and I'm the CEO of the San Diego Symphony Orchestra. And we are delighted to have you with us today at a real milestone in the life of the orchestra. We've said that a lot lately, um, but I think as we sit here, and as you're going to see at the end of this event, and walk into the completely reimagined and yet still the Jacobs Music Center that you know and love, um, it is a real moment in the history of this orchestra to have a new indoor home. Um, I will talk about that later, and John is next to me. John Frayne is with us today from HGA, and he's going to talk a lot about the hall. Um, and we're going to talk about the season that has been created to celebrate the reopening. And we are joined today by Raphael Payare, who is in London. He had his premiere of Barber of Seville with Covent Garden, Royal Opera House, Covent Garden, just a few days ago. He has two performances. Good morning, or good afternoon. Well, good evening, pretty much in here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to have you with us, Raphael. You and I have spoken since the premiere of the opera, but congratulations again. I know it's been, well, you've been Thank in London you. since when, January? Uh, since January 9th, I arrived in London for the beginning of rehearsal, and the first performance it started just in February 2nd, so, yeah. Been a while already. Yeah. Been a while already, and some of us are coming to see you soon in order to hear you with the London Symphony Orchestra here, Barbara, and celebrate your birthday. Yay, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Sounds like champagne for me, so. Um, yeah. So, Rafael, when... You think about this hall, which you haven't seen for a while, and yet um, you've, you've been in it. We're actually going to hear it today. Yao is here, and he's going to play a little for us. So we can oh, hear the nice. beginning of the acoustic. There's still a long way to go, obviously, but we'll hear something. And um, when you think of this orchestra coming in to this hall for the first time, and the work that you'll do as part of the tuning, I mean, you don't walk, just walk in and it's done, right? But... What, are, what do you think about that time, as you anticipate that? What is special about this moment, that moment that we oh, can anticipate? Oh, my God. I mean, it is, um, it is beyond saying that it's not every time that you have an opportunity to actually being able to enter into a new, even though it is our wonderful old hall, but it's going to be a new, completely renovated hall. So I am beyond ecstatic to say this, but it is great because we, as you have been in there, and actually everybody being at the moment over there, you will see the different stages that we have been. The last time I was there was a couple of months ago, but Martha always sent me photos and the thing we could actually be seeing how it is starting to actually become what is going to be our new home. And it's just going to be phenomenal. And um, of course, like when it happened with the, the radio show that we went and we started, well, that was a slimy force because it was COVID, of course. But in this time, we do not have to, even though COVID is still much around, no? but it's not going to be exactly the same thing that it happened before, that we actually, we could not be together. Now we will be able to get from the very beginning and we're going to start playing with the orchestra inside, different things for helping the tuning so the whole audience will be able to enjoy what I absolutely sure is going to be just a phenomenal, um, you know, moment to change everything that is going to happen with this orchestra. And it's, it is not because I am there and it's not because Marta is there, it is just because we are having a new hall. I mean, come on, people cannot say that every, th every time in, in their life. So I'm beyond ecstatic. Well, one of the things we're hoping for is um, more clarity on the stage and ability for the musicians to hear each other, which helps them make music it is better. And I, as I say, if, if, they're, if they, their music making is better, what you hear as an audience is better. Um, and just the, the clarity front to back and side to side. I think we got a taste of that actually at the shell because of the acoustic there. Exactly, exactly. And not only that, but because I, I know that before it was a little bit of a problem for the musicians to be able to actually hear each other, which is going to be improved. But we are going to get our call stall that we will be able to have in front of. So this is so new. I mean, I'm, I'm just to think about it that I get good from because it's so exciting. And this is why we are going to be, well, I'm going a little bit ahead, but that's why we are doing my last second. So, yeah. We can go right there. So um, yeah. 
it's interesting to make a season and really not know how the hall is going to work. Now, obviously, it's basic in terms of the season, but what I want to say is you have today an announcement of what we know of the season so far. There's more to come to the season. We will be making some other important announcements in the next several months um, about the season and some new kind of programming that we believe is going to be possible here. We're going to exp experiment, but we want to see it a little bit more closely before we do that. Um, so talk a little bit about those opening weeks, um, and uh, certainly the I mean, opening and mall. We are going to be, of course, because we, with the orchestra, we will be actually tuning the hall before just trying to prep for it. So we will be doing some things during October, just trying to get in, you know, like breaking a new shoot into this whole thing. But then, so for everybody, it's going to be ready to have the beginning of our new wonderful hall with Mahler Second. We are going to be presented with a, a new piece by Carlos Simon. And at the same time, not we are not only to be opening our new hall, which is a huge statement, but at the same time, we are actually going to be linked with the California Festival. So we will be joining our partnership just up north with LA and San Francisco, actually um, celebrating what is the music of our day. But we can do it in ourselves in San Diego. We will be doing some more things together. And then we are going to have a gala. We are going to be playing Tilo in the Spiegel. We are going to be doing La Mer, which we did a wonderful concert at the Shell, which was great to actually have, you know, uh, the ocean by playing La Mer. But at the same time, we thought this is something that is going to showcase the whole the new hall in a completely different way. So we need to do it again. We need to do it indoors. This is why we're actually repeating this program. But it, it, it is part of new different things that we're going to have. Teshu Kim. I mean, the amount of repertoire we're going to have, I could, I don't think you have enough time for me to be talking about this because I could go into every detail and we could spend here a few hours of just talking about that. Well, one of the things I want you to talk about is the Prokofiev Romeo and Juliet, because this is something else. It's later in the season, which is good, because we can then experiment, but this is really a theatrical and musical experience. Yes, absolutely. We're a partnership with our wonderful um, advisor, Gerard McBurney, and we will be using Prokofiev music from the street suite, but we will be taking Shakespeare text. Gerard is actually it's going to be working as well with Mike Tutai and in lighting. So we will be able to have a different kind of experience of a concert. As a matter of fact, we are going to be opening the concert with Schumann Spring Symphony, Symphony Number no. 1, and we are going to be doing it in a, let's say, um, not unorthodox way because it is, it, it, it was normal during that time to do it this way, but normally not for an orchestra. We are going to be playing the symphony standing. The whole Schumann symphony is going to be just as we were playing a little bit a few, day, a few uh, centuries ago. We are going to be the orchestra was going to be standing, and then the second part of it, our whole is going to be transformed into something completely different because we will be using audiovisual, we will be using light, and at the same time, the orchestra is in the center playing the magnificent score, which is the Prokofiev, Romeo and Juliet, but we will be using every single aspect of our whole. We have a tiny, tiny little bit of that kind of uh, um, showcase when we did um, in 2019, Midsummer, uh, Midsummer Nightmare from Mendelssohn. And we had it, and we knew that we could go further. So I was very excited when we were talking about what the whole could actually be doing. This is why we're putting it on what a best way to have it just immediately after our, our hall is going to be open. So this is why one of the things we're doing. So Mike Tutai has come here. He works a lot in Chicago and New York. He's a wonderful projection artist. And he came to do uh, our Noel Noel the last two years. And while he was here, he experimented with that wire mesh that will be the back wall and projecting on it. And it's going to be very exciting, I think. Um, you mentioned already Carlos Simon. There's also uh, Tarnopolsky, a yes, Ukrainian-born composer. Our second week, we're going to be doing Dan Makarov well from Vladimir Tarnopolsky, which is... Um, a Ukrainian composer that he actually had to emigrate for the horrible situation that is happening over there. And now he's 
eradicated in Germany. And we are very pleased that we actually commissioned a piece from him already when he just had in Germany just a few weeks after running from the terrible situation that is happening in there. And we just want to support his music and trying to have a little bit of, uh, of his wonderful language. So the, I am very, very excited that we are going to be showcasing that with the Miraculous Mandarin and the Rite of Spring, which is a wonderful piece that created a kind of a riot in Paris when it was performed. But nowadays, let's say that, well, hopefully we don't have a riot in San Diego when we do it, no? You know, but I'm, I'm very looking forward to actually be uh, showcasing this piece because it, it has so much of the virtuosity, so much of the whole thing that the orchestra will can have. And, uh, and it, it, will, it will somehow test the hearing or hearing of the whole audience at the whole hall. So we want to showcase that in week two. So just one last thing. You've got lots of your friends coming as soloists, friends, musical, you know, people that you love to work with. Pacho is coming back and, and others. Um, obviously, A Night with Yo-Yo, which is highly anticipated. That'll be great. Uh, yeah. One, you know, when you, when you came, you talked about these composers that were important to you. Mahler, certainly. Shostakovich, Schubert, Strauss. Mozart. Bruckner. There you go. I'm That's so where I was going. Was Bruckner. Yeah. Will you tell us you're getting to yeah. Bruckner now? Yeah, because I mean, um, the sound for Bruckner is something that's li slightly different that it needs to be uh, put on. And um, even though Bruckner is before Mahler, and we already started our Mahler cycle going on, that we are still going, of course. I mean, the first uh, concert that I had as music director, we started with Mahler 5. We have already done Mahler 1. We're going to be doing this year Mahler 4. Next year we'll be doing Mahler 2. So there are more things coming into the pipe. But the color for Bruckner, we couldn't really had the chance to do it there because that is a special kind of situation that we need to work and it needs to be from the whole. Even though our amazing acoustic at the Rady Shell are there and they help us at all, knowing that we were going to be opening Jacob Music Center, we said, well, let's just wait a little bit for this. And we have been kind of going into this kind of sound wall. We're going to be having Bruckner. We're going to be doing the ring with our words by uh, uh, the, the compel that Marcel did, the arrangement that Marcel put all together from this whole thing. So it is all a lot about of the, the sound that the orchestra is developing and that we will be exploring. Of course, we are also doing also different kind of uh, repertoire because as uh, people might know, we cannot just be eating the same time, you know, only one kind of menu. We need to be having a little bit of a, a kind of a menu degustation going on that we could be having different things to taste. Sometimes we just don't want to take, although I do love a steak, but no, we do kind of be eating every single time a steak. We are going to be having different things. And this is what we're going with the orchestra, with the different kind of sound. But I'm super, super excited. This is why we waited a little bit to do Rams with the orchestra, and now Schumann with the orchestra, Mozart as well, Bruckner, Wagner, and Mahler. So I'm super excited and beyond excited to what we're going to share with the world. Well, we got the food analogy in. I was afraid you'd kind of lost your appetite for that. So glad no, we got there. No, 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 never. <laughs> Raphael, it's good to see you. I talked to our friend Sean Murphy this morning. Sean, I always called um, my sound advisor, and Sean was here when we were doing the Acoustic of the Shell, and won, he won Best Engineer last night for Mason Bates Symphony, Sym Symphony Fantastique, Philharmonia Fantastique. We're going to be talking about that because we're going to perform it, and you're doing Mason's <clears throat> Violin Concerto with Gil. So with I heard Gil, both from Mason right. and Sean. Wow, well, please give a hug to Sean for me. That's fantastic. It's great. As he said, that and a cup of coffee. And $3 gets you a cup of coffee. But still, it was great. Good to see you. We'll see you in person soon. Thank you Absolutely. for being with us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. One never has to worry about any lack of enthusiasm on the part of our music director for what we do here. So um, I want to introduce you to two people, relatively new, um, to our team, 
AJ Benson is here from formerly of the, well, how shall we start? Carnegie Hall, Australian Chamber Orchestra and Orchestra of St. Luke's, has joined as Director of Artistic Planning and he had a lot to do with the season, so he's gonna to talk to us about that. Um, AJ, talk to us a little bit about the guest artists, uh, the programs that Raphael couldn't uh, Yeah, cover. some of the, the guest conductors, some of the new, you know, the other big initiatives that we had. Uh, first off, it's, it's a real pleasure being here. It's a real privilege to serve in this capacity with this organization. Um, I also want to acknowledge people who came before me, Clement So and my colleague Leah Slusher, who did a lot in getting this uh, whole season underway <clears throat> alongside Martha and, and Raphael. But just to kind of, yeah, jump off that idea of what else is kind of a big moment for the season, um, we talked a lot about Raphael's approach <clears throat> to the color of the orchestra, the sound of the orchestra. And I think that has kind of come into play not only with, with his programs, but with a lot of the other uh, conductors that are coming through. Um, we have a number of notable debuts this season. Um, Tian Yi Lu is making her debut with us. She'll be here in January with Jan Lejecki um, in a program that will also have uh, Richard Strauss, a tone poem, and Mozart Piano Concerto, so we see both sides of the orchestra in that element. She's a Chinese-born, a New Zealander um, by nationality. Paolo Bortolameoli is the associate conductor of the LA Philharmonic, and he'll be making his debut with us this season. He's brought us um, a really fantastic program that includes uh, the Sibelius Violin Concerto with Augustine Hadelish, one of the great performers living today. He's fantastic. He's been here before, but um, I'm sure you know everyone who's heard him can just understand the, the grasping of uh, kind of otherworldly elements of music making that kind of really stick with me when I hear him. Um, and he's also brought to us a piece by Miguel Farias uh, called Estellido, which is an explosion. So it's, uh, it promises to be a really exciting element to that particular program. Otto Tausk is the music director of the Vancouver Symphony. He'll be making his debut with us um, alongside Long Long and a really special Sunday afternoon concert um, you know, with the Tchaikovsky Ballet music. Ludovic Morlot, the former music director of the Seattle Symphony, is making his debut. He's, I guess you could say, kind of a, one of the, the upper echelons of his career, kind of mid-career, but he's uh, one of the statesmen. It's, it's, kind of, it's very exciting to have him with us. Um, Michael Tilson Thomas is also the legendary figure on our season who will be uh, joining us in a program that includes uh, two Sibelius symphonies and two works of his own. So that's kind of a special um, encapsulation of uh, some of these conductors that are coming through. And talk, uh, Laura Reynolds is our director, uh, vice president of Impact and Innovation and has also come to us recently. Um, I want the two of you actually to share the next one. Talk about the, the composers that we have coming. We have a long list. You were compiling it. Here, AJ, take my mic. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Laura. It is so great to see all of you, and I am so excited for all of you to experience our new season. Uh, yes, it's a very exciting year in terms of new music. We have, AJ, what is it, over 20? 20, 20 plus. 20 plus about, yeah. composers, um, one of whom is in the audience today. Uh, Teksu Kim is, is here today, so thank you for being here. Yeah, I feel like this season was really crafted with the idea of how we can how we can reflect our place and our time. And so that's why you're hearing so much new music. I'll talk in a bit about our new current series, which has quite a bit of new music alongside our family concert series, which also features living composers. Um, AJ, I know that yeah. you've been programming a lot on, on Masterworks too. It's pretty exciting to think about you know, bringing work into life, new work into life. I mean, we have a number of commissions in the season that we're you know, leading. Carlos Simon is uh, a composer who's uh, connected with the Kennedy Center. He's their composer in residence. And he's creating a work um, on the occasion of the reopening of the hall. So it's gonna be paired with the Mahler Second Symphony. He was just here this past week listening to the orchestra. He got a tour of the hall. He really wanted to get a sense of the space and the vibe, the energy in the, in the building itself and wanted to get a sense of how the orchestra sounds. So it's kind of a nice holistic approach, I think. 
Um, he was here on his way up to LA as part of the Grammys. So you can see he's active in many different fields. So I'm, I'm thrilled and very excited to see kind of how he um, crafts something really special, you know, for this season, for our audiences and for the orchestra. Um, we mentioned Vladimir Tarnopolsky. Uh, Gabriela Ortiz were, is a Mexican composer who's writing a work for Pacho Flores, the fantastic, exciting trumpet soloist. So we're part of a, a co-commission initiative on that new work. Billy Childs, the, the amazing uh, jazz pianist composer, is creating a new work for saxophonist Stephen Banks, and that's on our gala. Um, Mason Bates, we mentioned, and then Texu uh, is also writing new works for us. Um, but the other living composers in our masterwork season um, have been brought to us, their extant works. And you know, one of the things that we were talking about and hoping um, to really underline is that our art form is living and breathing. It's, it's alive. And these are works that a lot of our conductors who are visiting have championed. We have works by Sofia Gubaidalina, Joey Ralkins, who's a Dutch composer, all of you know, early 40s, and the really lovely and fantastic Anna Klein. Um, we're having a work that Tian Yi Lu is bringing. Yeah, and I'll only add to that, um, in thinking about things like our family concert series, we really want to make sure that even our youngest audiences know that this is a living, breathing art form. So we will be uh, presenting works by Jesse Montgomery, uh, Arturo Marquez, Carolyn Shaw, and, uh, and Mason Bates. So it's really exciting to be able to share that, even with our youngest audiences. Um, you want to talk about our newest series? I'd be happy to. So our newest series is called Currents, and this series is an interdisciplinary chamber music series. And uh, like I said, it's really designed to think about how we're reflecting today. The music of today, the issues of today, what what is happening in our society? And so we have three programs that we'll be presenting throughout the season. The first one starts with Difficult Grace, which features solo cellist uh, Seth Parker Woods and dancer choreographer Roderick George. It's just this incredible, joyful, yet um, serious journey um, that's semi-autobiographical. It explores the idea of the Great Migration. Um, Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series in is incorporated alongside text from the Chicago Defender. Um, and then we hear um, incredible poetry by Dudley Randall and, um, and Kami Alabi. And it is um, this beautiful, again, we were here just hearing uh, AJ and Raphael talk about what this new space can showcase. And so it will showcase the hall and all of the theatrical elements in this program. The second program is called Trace Minutos, which is about a brother and sister who are separated by citizenship. And it, it explores a real life story of um, the US-Mexico border and a program that reunites families for just three minutes. It's a chamber opera um, produced, co-produced with Music of Remembrance and Nicholas Lel Benavides, who is a local Southern California composer, wrote the work. Um, we're really excited to explore that. I mean, especially considering where we are in San Diego and um, this, this program actually happened in Friendship Park. Um, finally, the, the last program on the series is called The Wonders, The Wonders We Carry in, Inside, which is in support of women life freedom. And we are working with composer Gitti Razaz, who we are premiering this spring. She's an Iranian American composer, and we are building this program to celebrate the beauty and mysticism of Persian culture, but also the strength and courage um, that women have and the power that they have to shape our history. Um, it it's really timely um, and also, I, I hope, something that uh, reflects San Diego. All of these programs um, really are here to explore our identity, and I think the power of this program is in affirming, um, affirming our place and affirming people when um, sometimes it takes a lot of courage to be yourself. Um, so I'm excited to see how this series comes together and really excited for you all to experience it with us. Great, is there anything else you want to add before we go to John, is there anything we've 
Should I talk about the California Festival? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, so it, it also ties in with the elements of the new music um, community, too. So we are in partnership with two of our bigger um, colleagues up the coast um, when we talk with them, uh, with the LA Philharmonic and San Francisco Symphony in these calls, they all, they always ask me, how are things down south? <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a, it's been a really fantastic um, planning process and getting uh, what many of you might have seen in the New York Times last week, the California Festival off the ground and launched. Um, basically, it's an initiative that seeks to highlight um, organizations all throughout California um, with the encouragement of these organizations to produce, um, program, and present and perform works that have been written within the past five to, we're actually expanding it a little bit, to seven years. Um, so this will take place in November. It also coincides and overlaps with the opening of the Jacobs Music Center. And we're really, really thrilled to see how this kind of develops. Um, currently, we have, across the whole state, well over 40 five organizations that have signed on. Our initial goal was to have 30 people participate. We were you know, thinking if we get it up to 50, that would be amazing, and I think we're actually um, ex expanding beyond that. Um, so this, this is something to be um, really interesting to see how it develops over time and how we kind of incorporate it into other elements of what we're doing here in San Diego. And there are a number of San Diego organizations also participating, mainly Mozart and La Jolla Music Society, uh, San Diego Youth Symphony. Um, I think we've talked about oh, yeah. <laughs> we've talked about Art of Alan coming on board. There's an interest there. Any others? I was just going to add the youth orchestra. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Thank you both. Um, I think what you are hearing in terms of the season um, is our intention to celebrate our past and celebrate this hall and the. It's nearly 100-year-old existence. But even from the first concert where we're featuring young artists, we are saying, this, we've now created this. We've, we've made sure it will be sustained for the generations to come. And there is a sort of forward-looking nature to the creation of this season and the programming of the season. So we couldn't be more excited about that. Um, and subscription tickets are on sale. As of yesterday, the phones were ringing. So we are excited. So let's just turn our attention <laughs> and grab another microphone to the building itself. Um, and following this, as I said, you have an opportunity to walk into the construction site. Uh, I think everyone that I've gone in there with for the first time is sort of overwhelmed by the scope of this project. It seems like, as someone was saying earlier today, I thought you were just replacing the chairs. Well, it's, it's a lot bigger than that. Um, and Paul Scarborough is not with us today, but Paul Scarborough is the acoustician for this hall. He actually worked on this hall in, another, in his, an earlier capacity in his life when they put in the, the removable shell and ceiling panels. So he was very familiar. Um, and Paul came on board uh, early. I mean, Raphael was already named as music director. So between 18, I think late 2018, uh, and we started this conversation because it was, there were several reasons we wanted to take on this work. One was certainly acoustic. The hall has really good acoustics. There were some impediments for the music to get off the stage to the audience, and that's, that, we'll talk a little bit about that, and, and Paul addressed that. Um, and, Paul, and also there were structural issues, and there were audience issues. And, uh, there were backstage issues. There was, um, the, it was not the most commodious place for our musicians, even though work had been done for their spaces, but there wasn't enough space. And in this project you'll hear, we're picking up 15,000 square feet of space in the backstage area of previously completely unused and un underutilized space. Um, Paul gave us a list of several architects, and we uh, had presentations from all of them, and HGA emerged the strong number one um, in they were, they really had great ideas. They're wonderful listeners. They listen to all elements, including all the musicians at length, as to what they wanted from this hall, as well as Raphael. And they were also very um, keyed into the historic, historic nature of this hall and preserving that while allowing it to breathe and to, you know, come into the um, to present day and to the future. So, John, welcome. 
And we'd Thank love you. to hear from you some of the highlights, as it were, of this construction and where we are. Uh, thank you, Martha. Uh, I'm so excited to be here today, and I heard even more of what's going to happen in the next year, uh, starting in November. And it's just it's such an honor for our team and everyone here I'm representing to be a part of this. So so thank you. Um, yeah, there's a lot there's a lot happening behind this wall. Um, a lot of really really exciting stuff. Um, and so when I was thinking of that question of you know what will people experience when they come into this space, um, I think they're gonna they're gonna say wow. It all feels so familiar, but yet it feels really different and fresh. And um, yeah, that was really the goal we had because the building um, has been talked about so much today, has such incredible bones and such an amazing history. And so when we saw it, we said, we, we wanna figure out how to really respect this, but also you know, make this a world-class uh, symphony hall for uh, you know, the San Diego Symphony and, and, and really take the Jacobs Music Center to a new level. So I'm gonna just take you maybe through a quick walk through your experience as a, as a patron when you come into the hall. So um, you're gonna enter into the beautiful old historic lobbies. Um, and again, they're gonna feel really familiar, but just fresh. Um, yeah, there's some it's new lighting enhancements, new carpeting, um, but we really wanted to, to cherish that great history that was there. Um, and then as you move into the hall, uh, all the access to the hall has been um, reconfigured. Uh, and, and that was both to create some of that additional new space Martha was talking about, but also to make all parts of the hall much, much more accessible to the entire community. Um, and so as you move into those spaces, um, they also help with the acoustic separation, which is you know, obviously a really important consideration here. Um, and then when you, you enter into the hall, at first you're gonna say, oh, there's that beautiful ceiling, the gorgeous proscenium, all the features you really love about the hall. And then you're gonna look around and say, ah, yes, there are all new seats, this is great. But the seats are also, they're different on both the orchestra and on the uh, balcony level. So on the orchestra level, it's gonna feel a lot more intimate. Everyone's gonna be much closer to the stage. And the orchestra level is now broken up into eight different seating areas, um, all at different elevations. So your views to the stage are gonna be greatly improved, which of course has a strong correlation as we always talked about with Paul of your, your experience of the music. Um, and then uh, on the, or on the uh, balcony level, uh, that all new seating as well, and two new uh, great accessible seating positions um, on either side of the grand tier. And a really special moment, uh, on the Angels Walk, there's gonna be six new box balconies that are gonna be a view that people have never ever had this hall before. So that's gonna be really exciting. Um, then once you've found your seat, you're gonna turn, you're gonna look at the stage and you're gonna say, wow, this is where of the, the bulk of the work that you can see has been done. Um, so at the stage level, uh, there's actually a great picture over there. You know, that red valance that was over the stage, that actually hid a giant concrete beam. And so working with Paul, um, that was one of the big moves we've done is take away this giant concrete beam. Um, and what that's done, <laughs> I see someone clapping, um, that's, that's allowed us to do two really important things. Um, one is to couple the seating area with the stage, um, both visually, but as well as acoustically. Um, and then that's been combined with a new fixed enclosure around the shell, and that fixed enclosure will allow both a chorus and audience members to sit in the back side of the stage. Um, so you'll be able to see Raphael's face as he's uh, conducting pieces and all these other amazing conductors that will be here. Um, what, that, what that also has allowed us to do is create much, uh, much more improved acoustics and a much stronger coupling between the performers and the audience members. Um, what removing that big beam also did um, was it's allowed us to create a new array of 20 reflectors on the ceiling, and those will be fully tunable reflectors. Um, so that combined with enhancements within the hall is gonna greatly increase the ability for the orchestra to tune the space to individual pieces, as well as just make it just right for uh, the, the orchestra members you have. Um, so those are the kind of things you're gonna see and experience there. There's gonna be something really important that you're gonna feel as well, which is that all of the mechanical and electrical and heating and cooling systems have been upgraded in the building. So um, the hall is gonna actually just, when you're sitting there, feel a lot more comfortable. And that's work that actually was uh, completed about a year ago, and we're going through the testing on that all right now. I would say that not only is it all new, but it's also moved up to hang underneath the parking garage, suspended over the, our, our building's roof and not touching it, which means there's no vibration, there's no sound of that HVAC system. 
the hall was fairly noisy when you all had gone home and we were sitting in there all by ourselves, you could hear so much background noise, which really interferes with your appreciation of the music. Sound is made on silence, as we like to say, and that's gonna feature in our youth concerts next year. Um, but you will have a lot more silence, which means the orchestra can play a lot more pianissimo, quiet music, which is critically necessary when you come to hear Mahler's Second Symphony. It's got the most extreme from the quietest moments to the most glorious. So um, that is a big improvement in terms of the acoustic as well. Um, you want to talk just a little bit about the backstage space, the 15,000 square feet, what yeah. we get there? Yeah. Um, and I think that's something that um, all of you here today, and when we go inside, you're going, you're going to see. And it's something that no one, when they, once we're done, no one's going to see it, but it's so important. So uh, yeah, when we go inside, um, you're going to see the stage house is all opened up right now. Um, Below the stage, we've reconfigured all the spaces below stage, um, which has allowed us to create a new suite of practice rooms for the musicians, as well as a range of performance uh, support spaces. Um, so greatly enhancing um, the kind of quality of um, life of the performers and other people who come to visit the hall, which is really important. You, know, you were talking about kind of this holistic approach, um, that it's both the hall plus the ecosystem of people that are here. Um, on the two sides of the stage, um, by creating that fixed acoustic enclosure that's allowed us to improve the sound within the hall. It also allowed us to find that 15,000 square feet that Martha was talking about. So um, on both sides, you're gonna see five new levels of support spaces, new music library, uh, entry space, the choral terraces, um, spaces for um, offices for staff. So um, all, all those are you're gonna kind of currently see there. And then when we, when we come, first come into the hall, you're also gonna see the new back edge of the ceiling um, it'll be, it's kind of this really distinctive arc, um, and that'll really give you a sense for just how much more intimate that seating experience is going to be on the orchestra level. Uh, and then behind us there, between the old, beautiful, historic lower lobby and the new seating, um, there's, a, there's a new control room, uh, there's a new space for um, patrons and for small ensembles to perform, as well as a whole series of state-of-the-art technical spaces. Because you're going to remember this used to be a movie hall, so now we're, we're taking it you know, fully and officially from being in a movie hall to being a world-class symphony orchestra space. Thank you, John. Thank you. That's great. Um, so I know you're anxious to go in there, and you should be. Um, I just want to say that um, none of this would be possible uh, but for the hard work of many people. Um, many members of the staff are here. The administrative team, you can imagine what it has been like to begin the planning of a new outdoor venue continue the planning of an outdoor venue, start the construction of an outdoor venue, and then have COVID. <laughs> Meanwhile, while we were completing the construction of Rady Shell at Jacobs Park, we began the work here on moving the HVAC system and were in detailed planning for the renovation of this hall, well before it was announced. That HVAC work came at the time of COVID when we were thinking about fresh air circulation and um, and, and all of the emerging technologies in terms of making sure this is a healthy hall as well. So it couldn't have come at a better moment. That same team has now gone full throttle into opening the Rady Shell. Where we will announce that season, I think, on March the 5th, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the, the third summer at Rady Shell at Jacobs Park. And as we said, now we're just running it. <laughs> but the first two years of operation, we were learning a lot about operating that venue. Um, and meanwhile, doing all of the work necessary to support this um, renovation. So it has been a very intense time period. And those of you who are here today, I just want to give a round of applause. You've been fantastic leaders, and, and uh, they don't complain. Uh, the one thing, sometimes Travis, who's heading up the facilities, Travis and I laugh because some people complain when we're in the office about the noise, and I say, that are the glorious sounds of construction progress. I will never complain about the noise. Um, but it's, uh, it's a great team. Uh, we have a distinguished and hardworking board of directors. Hal Fusen is chair, is here in the front. Mitch is here, Kathleen, uh, there's, sorry, Nancy. Um, they have had to take on the support of a lot of risk and have voted yes every time. 
um, are tremendously supportive of um, our work here. Um, I'm sure at times it seems um, overwhelming or are they really crazy that we're doing yet one more thing? But if they have those conversations in private, they never show it to us publicly. And so um, they are wonderful to work work with and their leadership is really critically important. And we are about to enter the Joan and Irwin Jacobs Music Center. And Joan and Irwin are not here today, but they're here in spirit. And we all know that none of us would be sitting here had it not been for their generosity and their stewardship, their leadership, and for the love they have for this orchestra. And then, of course, the musicians themselves who can't be, one of them is with us today. Yao is here, but um, the rest are at the Civic Theater where they're rehearsing um, with San Diego Opera. Um, performances coming up, opening night is Saturday night. Uh, we love our partnership with the opera. We love being the opera orchestra. And it is also, they are great partners and it's an important part of who we are and important part of how we activate downtown. And that's my closing comment, I would say, is that our downtown needs all of the innovation and all of the construction and all of the building and all of the imagining of its future that is happening today. And you look around and you see the number of cranes. It gives us hope for the vitality of this city. Um, we firmly believe as an institution we are part of that. And developing two venues in the downtown is our way of assuring that people who are living here and people who are living in other areas are coming downtown, staying downtown, um, we really believe in this city and being, being stewards of the city and being part of the fabric. So that is another great reason for what you're going to see today. Um, I think, Kristen, did I forget anything? I didn't look at your beautiful notes. All good? And on time? Okay, we have time for three questions. Unless... Good question. How far along are we? What, where, what's the status now, John, of the $125 million construction? I should have said that number earlier. Uh, the status is we are on track for the November 4th opening. Um, um, that, that's a good question. I don't, I, I, I don't know the percentage, but we could get you that from the contractor. Um, they, they would have a specific number on that. Um, but what you're going to see when you go inside is um, all of the big infrastructural moves have been done. And right now we're in the process of just putting the, the sort of layers back together um, so that ultimately we'll get to the spot by, I think, um, late summer, early fall, where we're doing um, all the fine acoustic tuning. And I think it's in November, October that the orchestra gets in and they really start practicing how to play this new giant instrument they have to put on the, the performances they'll do. I would say when we talk about that tuning schedule, that there are 20, no, yeah, 20 ceiling panels. They're made out of fiberglass, right? And they're carved. I don't, they were hanging, they're not here anymore, but they were hanging so we could see how they look and fit and so forth. They're slightly angled. And these panels actually rotate front to back and side to side. So the orchestra will play short segments of a variety of different kind of repertoire. And then they'll take a break, and then Paul and his team will come in and d direct us to adjust those panels, and then we'll go back over it. For, a f for several services will be devoted just to that. Um, and then that'll stop, because the orchestra then has to get used to the room on themselves. It's like they have a new instrument, right? So they have to understand what's happening, and what they, how they have to play, how they have to project, or they project less, or, you know, it, it, it will, be their adjustment period. So that'll be kind of an exciting time. Anybody else? Good. We're delighted you're here. And I, I should also say the other number, the hall had seating of 2,200 in its former iteration. It will now have 1,700 fixed seats in the, in the current or in the former seating areas and an additional roughly 85 seats at the back in what we call the choral terrace when there is no chorus. So there's a new, whole new seating area where you will be behind the orchestra on the side of the orchestra looking out. And you'll, you'll note that when you're in there. You're going to see the, uh, already the infrastructures in place for the choral terrace. 
Great. Thank you for being here, and we look forward to seeing you during the season. <laughs>